let's start with what we did last time, guys. Um, anything good that's happened this week? Do you want me to remind everyone that I'm talking at Reflex? Is that what you're asking me to do? You are. You, you are talking about Reflex, and Red. we've not forgot. And goodness to Cyprus. Hopefully with Tony's still being ignored 100 percent and at the end of may at, at the beginning of june actually we are launching two very exclusive limited edition probably once and that's it uh, courses as well for cyprus one will be specifically designed for corporations and companies going through a transition usually those companies that uh, hit the ceiling they grow organically now they need to regroup and reform or for uh, startups getting into 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 grown-up phase for those companies that are going through a transition and we will teach them methodologies frameworks and and strategies used by fortune 500 around the globe to win competition and to position themselves above the others for cyprus and beyond so that will happen at the beginning of june uh reach out to us if you want to know about more and also ash we're doing something very special utilizing quite a lot of your skills as well for personal brands yeah, so that second second workshop we're going to be doing is a personal brand workshop. And I guess it's really for anyone who's looking to um, find their story, find their audience, communicate that story. Uh, so whether you're a professional working at a company, founder or an entrepreneur in Cyprus, uh, this one's for you. Um, it'll be kind of brand new stuff that we haven't taught anywhere else. So that's going to be exciting. And the participants will get um, eight hours with, you know, us three um, to really dig into their, I guess, the bigger narrative and how to build an audience. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And the bonus is that you'll get to witness real life Wesisms. Yeah, real life Wesisms, <laughs> uh, frameworks that you learn on Friday, you can implement on Monday. We're going to be having a networking session as well. And and this is stuff that usually goes for 50, 60K and, and tickets yeah. are like yeah. like are 800 now for the corporate one, 400 yeah, the early for the birds. personal one, the yeah. early birds for, for the next 10 tickets. And it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah, pure, pure value. But what about today, guys? Oh, today. Yeah. Today, this is um, this is this is a good one, An another good one. Um, so I'm just going to introduce the guest now. So we're five minutes in. Um, look, this is someone I met probably four years ago on LinkedIn, and I can't believe it's been that long. Actually, um, he's the person that first showed me the the ropes when it comes to me when it came to me using LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn the proper way. And when I mean the proper way, I mean for business and uh, sales specifically um before before doing what he does today uh, and that's helping people use content and sales on linkedin he worked in the city of london um he trained corporate sales teams over the years he's been in sales for a long time he's been in digital marketing before that he's worked with some really cool well-known global brand names too many to real um off but you can check his website and before that um uh, yeah, I, I think I think he was he sort of started in sales. Um, so he's done it all marketing, uh, sales. He's helped build up startups to global teams and um, coaching new business professionals. He's a conversion coach for consultants, and it will, we'll get him to explain what that is exactly. He's a speaker, mentor, and uh, founder of the LinkedIn uh, Client Accelerator, which is I'm part of as well. Uh, where and along with 200 other active members learning how to optimize their uh, LinkedIn efforts to make money in their specific field of expertise. So, um, yeah, I, 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 again, I'm sure you know who we're talking about. It's none other than Richard Moore. Welcome to the Water Cooler Brand Talks, Richard. Good afternoon. Nice to meet you. And thank you for the uh, full intro. I really appreciate that, Ash. That means a lot. Did I miss anything? uh no you you got it all i think uh that's a first uh, i'm really yeah <laughs> there you go uh, it's so nice being here i've seen this this show uh you know a few times from afar so it's nice to be on it and uh so nice to meet you all uh, and hang out for a bit and uh hopefully bring some value to already over 80 people watching right now it's kind of cool that's cool. great brilliant so Richard, you know, before we get started, like I, I've got kind of a three segments. I've sent, mm. sent you some notes before. We've not got 
question, we'll just fire questions and we'll pick questions from the audience as well. So I want to go through content that converts um, beyond content creation and um, selling online and the impact it has on the brand. But before we do that, do you want to kind of just give us a, a little bit more detail in terms of how long you've been using LinkedIn yourself and how you got into it? So specifically this kind of thing, um, I I would say I, I started in earnest with LinkedIn content, helping people convert was the thrust of it uh, at the beginning of 2018. So already that's six years. It's crazy how fast time's gone, right? And, um, you know, like anyone else, when you start, it's like, right, just post stuff that feels about right. And my the thing is my background isn't branding isn't marketing isn't design my my background is selling and my first decade of my career was cold calling in many different guises and so it's nice it was nice and quite refreshing to from 2014 start with facebook but going into linkedin it's just like suddenly it was so much more straightforward because of context and what i loved about it was i didn't have to do too much to have people to talk to and then of course it was like wow someone actually is willing to talk and then it's all of the the fun and nuance and engagement um uh, techniques to uh to have great relationships and see where it goes from there so it's one hell of a pond to fish in it really is and um it's uh yeah it's been it's been a rocket for my business i'm really thrilled that i'm not still trying to do it on facebook because it was definitely harder there yeah yeah and so, yourself, I think you you said in the intro that like we we connected. I think it was twenty twenty. Um, was it twenty twenty? Yeah, I was trying to think. So that's about four years, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and I think for many, if you go back back to then, it was you know there's this thing of like, well, I'm trying on on Facebook and I'm trying on Instagram, and even twenty twenty, it was still quite early with mm -hmm. this content as a way to attract for a business was actually done from back in like twenty seventeen. But it was only in the summer of 2017, I think it was August, when they allowed, it was it was status updates and like you could add a white paper, but then mm. it became like, we'll now allow you to upload video. And that was a big game changer. Yeah. So you had a lot of people who were creative types who wanted to explore that. And, and I remember 2018 felt like this new world and it was, you know, there's content creation now, it's still a tiny bubble relatively speaking but it, back then it was like everyone knew who everyone was and it really felt quite small so it's kind of fun and so collaborative and i just remember the the vibe back then was like let's not spoil it that was the general consensus like let's not spoil this in the way that other social media mm. channels might be spoiled somewhat it was there's a lot of toxicity around isn't there and there's a lot of like trolling and narcissism and so on it's so it was so refreshing everyone was being supportive collaborative and professional and i loved it because it's i'm just could... what you say there let's not spoil it how do you think the same as in what do you think of it now specifically on linkedin do you feel it I think is it's a great space i think we've got to remember that we see what we curate and so my experience now, like today's experience on LinkedIn, aside from this, this is wonderful, but the experience I have on LinkedIn is actually a really positive one. And the reason why is such features as unfollow. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to see more posts like this, please, LinkedIn. Yeah. The moment I see the kind of content that doesn't align with what I'm trying to do, I'll get rid of it. And that's such a beautiful thing because it means the content is, and this is something I've lent into really hard. I do it all the time, but in the last few weeks in particular, like really deleting those things that are filling up the newsfeed with things that aren't that stimulating. And so I think it can still be a really positive place. And you know how it is, you surround yourself with the right people who are collaborative. It really goes a long way. But I think, uh, I know what you're saying, and what we've got to remember always is that there's no wrong or right way of doing things. There's what works for you and your audience. Mm. And what's fascinating, as someone who was selling internet marketing 20 years ago, so I, I was a proper nerd 30 years ago with the early internet dial up and bulletin boards and that, and seeing that evolution, what's fascinating is the current generation who are leaning into it 
uh, in their way. So we look at Gen Z, who are like mid twenties, late twenties now. They've cut it. They've not been doing it for a few years. They've been doing it for 10, 12 years through Instagram and so on. And they've cut their teeth on those kind of platforms, but they're coming to more of a business age and many want to be freelance or whatever. And what's fascinating is that they're coming here and bringing their flavor of, for instance, high attention grabbing hooky video from other platforms. And that inverted commas works for certain audiences. So it's fascinating seeing what they're doing and that's mm. helping to evolve other markets and other areas as well. And it's really interesting. Like it's always this melting pot of dinosaurs, those at the bleeding edge, those who are the up and coming and seeing where, you know, edge effect is, you know, so I, I, there's a lot to unpack in that, but I just find it's fascinating to see what's working for some people and what speaking for, as myself, but what, and I'd love your, you guys, your opinion on it. What I think is really important is the sense of integrity around well, what, what's going to hype me to the point that it, of distraction where I go try something else and what, where should I stay in lane so that I continue to resonate with the target market for specifically me and specifically my service, you know, yeah, very easy to go get popular. But it doesn't necessarily mean my brand is aligned with who I'm trying to target. Yeah, it's 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 fascinating because it's a tricky balance between who you are and and who you want to attract and what you want to do, right? So there has to be a strategic intent of the on from the content perspective to reach the goal that you want to reach, but also in a way that aligns to your personality and feels authentic and non constructed. I think the challenge for every social media now is uh, is real authenticity, right? So we are living in the age of AI. We're living in the age where. I think the only thing that I don't like about LinkedIn potentially is that uh, rewrite with AI. I think that's that's something that I did not completely understood, and I think it's it's too much of a gimmick that takes away from from what LinkedIn is really doing well, which is person to person kind of real connection. And yeah. and I know it with you, you are you Richard are doing really well because like speaking with you on the backstage. You're exactly as you as you appear on LinkedIn. One of the best experiences that I had is what with Ash because I didn't know him right in real life. I only knew him from the content on LinkedIn, and then we ended up in a in a brand workshop together. And he was exactly as expected it. And I think that's the beauty of LinkedIn, right? So people yeah. tend to be more out, more more authentic. But it's interesting what you said about the evolution and new joiners coming. I see the flip side happening in TikTok. If you see with the recent campaign, so TikTok is no more for youngsters, but mm. actually all the generations are going there and learning new things. So there is a beautiful transition in social media happening between older and newer generation. And well, how arguably that's the beginning or, or it's the end of the beginning for TikTok. Yeah. And it's the big potentially the beginning of the end. Facebook now is everyone's parents and grandparents. Mm. Yeah. And if I go, I don't go on anymore, but if I was to, I know that I'd, I'd find someone who's 65, who's a family friend telling me, you know, what type of ferret they are because <laughs> uh, they did some kind of quiz. Um, and so it's like, <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> you know, you know, that kind of thing. And it's fascinating because, because the, the parents want to see what the kids are up to. So they go in there and gentrify it and it ends up not being as cool. TikTok <laughs> has got that kind of is gone to that uh, you know that kind of size where so many different things can happen with it but it's going to potentially lose its edge if enough of the older people who are a little bit more naff or whatever come in and, and kind of uh take away its edge and of course there'll be the, the next thing so it's really interesting seeing that kind of evolution it kind of happened to facebook what mm. i find is beautiful is the um, sense of direction, and this is my read on it, the sense of direction that LinkedIn itself has, because it's recognizing that content creation is a thing, but it's not all of it. Mm. Think about even like statistically, now it's only just ticked over 1% of its users who actually post content. And remember that isn't everyone posting like we do, that's mm. technically posts content. So the vast, statistically, the vast majority of people using LinkedIn use it in the old school, classic networking and relationship Rolodex resume style that we all know from the past. And 
what I love is that LinkedIn's not leaning so hard into content creation that that you know that vast majority of, of its users are feeling alienated. It's a thing it does, but it's not the be all end all. That's my hunch, for instance, as to why LinkedIn stories is no longer a thing on the app. Mm. Two thirds of all users are using the app on their mobile and they've got LinkedIn stories and no one actually, no one statistically actually uses them. Mm. What the hell are they there for? So it, they, they're, they're, staying, they're staying tight with what they know people want to use it for. Because of course, if everyone leaves, ad revenue, mm. <laughs> things mm. like that. So that's my view on it. It's one, one man's mm. view. I think that's the play there. They're, it's slightly more muted than it might be compared to say TikTok, where the thing you do is content creation there by comparison. So let, let's just stick with the content creation. I know there's a lot more than um, in terms of what you do, um, but the actual content, what makes um, content effective at generating leads? And I know this is a big topic, but um, you know what, what makes good content, uh, yeah. content that will generate leads versus something that's not? And if you can give me some examples. Yeah. I, I, you add ways? Yeah, because I, I, I'm a big advocate of not selling. I, I really have a fear of it. I'm not going to lie. Like, hands on heart, my LinkedIn doesn't really convert at all. It's not, you know, it's got engagement. It's got, it's got. I guess it's a crowd pleaser, but it, it doesn't get anything over the line in that respect. Mm. Uh, I fear trying to sell. I do really. Like, these guys are trying to get me to kind of sell more, but I, I, don't, I fear it. So what... You know, if we if we go under the premise that people love to buy but they hate to be sold to, like what is the theory then? Uh, what well, I think what Ash was alluding to, like what what in your mind or what little hacks have you got that makes the content that isn't isn't created to sell sell? Yeah, and I think it's worth adding to that that saying, which in in fact because people in the main people hate to sell in the classic sense as well. They not, don't just hate to hate to be sold to, yeah. and. So that's what it comes down to. And actually, the good news is that the best way to sell is not selling in the way people think. People think sales is the classic style, knock on door, intrude yeah. and push something. Whereas everyone loves to sell when someone wants to buy from them. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I hate selling becomes a fucking love it. I absolutely love it when someone's like, yeah. How can I buy your thing, please? So the answer to your question is like mapping to the outcome. What would it look like if your content attracted people, job one, but crucially because everyone's like, oh, attention is the game. Sure, but not. Attention, but in the right way. So attraction, but also positions you as well. Hmm. So for instance, with higher ticket, premium services, at positioning you as an expert which you three do for instance with your workshops you know it's not it's not a quid 50 to join no. and it's for it's a premium level uh, service we're buying the the vibe an audience member needs to start getting is not only do they clearly know what they're talking about an expert in fact they're my expert and what that means is that there's a level of fondness and resonance with you specifically. And that's that's your world, you guys, of brand. And there's a million, with all love, there's a million people who work with brand workshops. But the reason why people choose you is because it's like, we don't want someone just to do brand workshops. We want the WAM team to do it because they're they're legit the best in class in our, in our minds. Mm. So answering your question directly, the content should attract on a level where it clearly demonstrates you know your stuff, but it also should position as I'm best in class and I see higher than the average person like that you, the average peer like me. Mm -hmm. What that looks like is here's evidence of me doing a thing. Here's examples of me winning. Here's mm -hmm. examples of clients winning too. Here's me showing I clearly know what I'm talking about, but crucially his awareness of what you as an audience member are actually experiencing and going through. I get you. I'm reassuring you that I understand what you're going through. And that awareness is crucial because then the audience member starts feeling, wow, this person really understands the symptoms I'm experiencing. 
now you've got this magnetism and they can't help having conversations with you. The moment you position right to the right people you've attracted, you can have a conversation. And that's when you take it from there and move elegantly towards conversion. What you don't do is pitch up front. I've done enough of that in the past to know that it's unwanted and you have to be bloody good to get someone to go, do you know what then I'm willing to listen? Mm. And there's a massive difference between willing to listen and running at you. It's attraction we're after, isn't it? So yeah. So that, that's the kind of the tactical side is that we're positioning always as premium because we've got to ask ourselves, who is it that they want us to be? They want us to be, to sure have an opinion, but they also want us to be a superhero. So a superhero with an opinion on, on, on so, we, so it's like they stand for something, they, they have the vibe we resonate with, but also clearly they're further down the path than we are and therefore might be the guide we're looking for. Yeah, it's interesting. Like there is a lot to untangle that, but like one of the key concepts from, from what you just said is like, uh, it reminds me of a quote I put possibly was Christo or, or someone around that had said, like, if you're able to explain your client's problem better than they are, you gain the trust that you have the solution. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and, and that goes back into positioning, isn't it? Being positioned in a way that when the demand arises, they come to you. Right. Yeah. And, and that's a warm conversation, isn't it? That you don't have to sell anymore. They understood. And, and the way that you're doing beautifully and the guys are doing, are doing really well as well is creating content to be top of mind when mm. the need, the, when the need arises, right? In, in brand, in branding term positioning. And, and look, if we can imagine a scenario for the audience to, to encapsulate exactly what you said, Martin, imagine someone visiting like I love this example of a doctor, a patient visiting a doctor, the patient's in panic, the super worried because something's not right with their body. It's a blind spot. They don't know what's going on. The body that they've lived with every day is doing something that's not feeling right. They're panicking. They're worried. Something's off. And then the doctor nods sagely and he or she says, I know exactly what it is. It's OK. You'll be all right. Yeah. The solution, it's fixable. And essentially what they're saying is, I've got this. That's reassuring. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's it's you may be worried about these problems. You may be or, or another um, uh, kind of emotion to be tapping into in your content is less worry, more frustration. Mm -hmm. That's what I tap into. Mm -hmm. the people I tend to work with best are the ones who, or the ones who convert most readily are frustrated. The board of all the courses on getting more engagement. Yeah. The board of how to make their profile look more optimized. Uh, it's yeah. Done already. And I want to. I, I, I want to dig into that. Actually, there's this misconception in that people think you have to have these this huge amount of uh, followers, right, or consistently viral content. And I think these kind of courses and teachers. Um, they 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 prey on that right like you need viral content you need loads of followers um to make money on linkedin but obviously i've learned this from you over the years this couldn't be further from the truth right well you're gonna i'm not really revealing who it is but next week you're covering this stuff humans as an human animals revere status we're hardwired to revere status right so that's on you know on the serengeti when we're in our tribes or whatever it would have been that's how we, that's how we were the person who's king or queen of our of our tribe we look up to mm. so engineering synthetic status in is easy inverted commas because we revere big numbers and it's interesting because this we talked earlier about the evolution of the internet when i was selling <laughs> internet marketing in 2003 i could sell a banner Remember that like banner on, on a website where well, it's clickable, I, like the ads, like the like ads you get on websites now. And, you know, we'd sell a number of impressions and people would click on that stuff. And it's like, oh, my God, you got a load of impressions. You must be good. And then it evolved to like, you know, when Twitter came out, it's how many followers have you got? If you've got lots of followers, you must be successful. And my point is, it's, it's big numbers. The mainstream narrative is that big numbers are good numbers. Mm. And so because it's inverted commas easy 
relatively speaking, it's easy to get followers and it's easy to get engagement. Anyone here listening, if you want loads and loads of engagement and hundreds of comments on every single post, all you've got to do is every hour of your waking day, comment LinkedIn, nonstop, try and complete LinkedIn. And if you do that every day for months on end, by the pure virtue of the fact you're on everyone's radar, you will get lots of comments. That's how it's done. There's no tricks. It's not even engagement pods. It's just that. And that gets yeah. engagement. So it's easy to engineer that status. And of course, and I'm going to be brutal here, that kind of synthetic status of higher, bigger numbers is a wonderful band-aid and a diversion from the reality that your business isn't acquiring any new customers. Because mm. the moment you're getting clients and putting money in the bank, suddenly the followers don't matter anymore. And I mean it, and like the people I work with who are making over a million a year, solopreneurs, by the way, mm. they couldn't care less about the engagement. They don't care because they've got the better number, the more important one for themselves. So it's Richard, I, 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 I totally agree with you. And I, I've, I'm in the group as well. And I see others making that kind of money. Uh, and I know what works as well in terms of what I've applied. Um, they're playing devil's advocate. Someone now coming in on this call and thinking, I've only got 1000 followers. That's great. You're, you're, you saying all of that stuff, but yeah. I'm not getting the reach with the right people. What am I doing wrong? I want to really attack this point because what people often say is, how is it, Richard, you get the right people stepping forward and I get the wrong people stepping forward as though only that cohort of people are choosing to step forward and indeed are looking in the first place. No, what's actually happening is everyone's looking. Sure, sometimes it's a smaller pool, of that whole spectrum. So, you know, you might have 10,000 people view your post today, Ash, I might have 4,000 people, but they're, they're all, they're gonna be mainly a bit of everyone. What we're trying to do is get the right sliver of that spectrum stepping forward. It's a positioning question. Mm -hmm. So the reason why I was closing sales in the first month or two of doing this, when I had under a thousand followers, was because sure, I'm good at selling and whatever, sure. But the point is that I was saying the right things to the right people and it doesn't require loads more people to be showing up. What it requires is me to resonate more with the right people. If I changed my style of content, I would still get a load of people looking, but I would have the inverted commas wrong people stepping forward because I would then be appealing to them instead. I think what's really interesting is that they are there. It's just you're turning them off by saying the wrong thing or coming across as the wrong the wrong thing. And if I can give an example, if I um, if I do a story being vulnerable about how I messed up this week and totally have dropped the ball with a load of clients because I just can't handle life right now, that's a really noble, amazing thing that you've shared. And like how strong you are to to be like that and share that publicly but there's no bloody way someone's going to come and buy from you now the right person they're like i'm so sorry you've had a hard time but like i'm not i'll buy from this guy over here then because you clearly can't hold it together and that's hardcore but that's how it is and so we have to be yeah. careful about what we're saying and the reason why you can I mean, the average person in my group has 1500 followers and the reason why they get deals the ones that get deals is because they focus on and this is the ultimate takeaway they focus on going deep one-on-one -on -one with the individuals so i want to i want to I, about the I, dm i want to drill into that this now this part as well um a lot of people leave a lot of money on the sorry to sound crude but they leave a lot of money on the table by just posting and ghosting right they're not looking intentionally or or they might reply to everyone and everything and that's a nice thing to do but we you can't sustain that kind of activity when you've got a business to run right unless what are the, what business, are the that's the only exception like to be to be fair to some people 
some people trade off having a huge following and massive engagement mm. good for you and other people have a massive following engagement that's what they focus on because then they don't have to do anything and a few people self-sell and say look i want to buy something take my money please and they get a couple out the bottom but my but it's really right that we're talking like this because the average person doesn't have those things the average person doesn't have the time they're running a business and they want to do basic things show up get some form of conversion or at least start that process and then close the browser and get on with their zone of genius which is doing their work what that looks like is if any this is how i started in a nutshell if anyone dares blink in my direction i'll get in touch and say hi and when i go from there i will take them into conversation i'll get to know them and let's see where that takes us meanwhile the content's doing the heavy lifting over time medium term of warming them up but you can't be being in the dms and just speaking to people that seems old school but like humans buy from humans that they like and get on with and feel reassured by and the mm. content can do a lot of that but nothing beats being with them directly and like what offsets is whatever what offsets incredible abundance and every no one knowing you and thinking highly of you is the love and care you give to someone in a moment when you're speaking to them one-on-one -on -one. that's how i hit six figures without a big personal brand, without loads of engagement on Facebook by just messaging people and just took it from there. So, so what are what are the what are the signals that you want to look out for? Because generally people don't turn around in their comments and say, here, take my money, right? Yes. So um, so yeah. there's a, there's an there's an art in this as well, isn't there? Yeah, nor do they say, by the way, I've got a really big struggle I'm going through. Like, I, I, I really think our brand needs work, <laughs> Ash. I just don't think they, they speak like that. What happens is having a conversation on a base human level to start with is what connects us to people. And that earns you the right to then ask a more probing question. There's a thing called conversation momentum, which is if we're back and forth constantly, I can now, I've kind of earned the right somewhat to ask a slightly more probing question just because we've chatted a bunch. And that question should be a light one. It, you know, for me, it would be, so how's the LinkedIn performing out of interest? Just mm. something like that. It's a very reasonable question. It's not, so what challenges have you got or what keeps you up at night? Mm. Because that's like I'm in the seventies trying to sell, mm. you know? So instead it's, it's just like, so how's it, how's it all going? Or, or like, if someone says something, this is the beauty of content. If someone says something about my content that is totally in lane with the stuff I do, like, hey, that was a really good post today. I'm totally in because I can just be particular with them. So the question I ask there is, thank you. What part in particular was interesting? Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing, the technique I'm doing is I'm taking the thing they talk about, the thing, and isolating it and asking a what based question so ash i thought your talk today was really cool with martin and wes thank you for that that's the acknowledgement and that's where people leave it they're like oh, now what do i do mm. now we want to progress it what part in particular was useful yeah oh, i love the bit where wes said whatever yeah the natural next step this is so simple after the what question it's a why question why is that? And whatever their answer is, it will represent to a degree where they feel they could, there's a knowledge gap or they could improve or there's a bit of a need. And that's the bit where if you choose, you could, if they're really going for it, they're giving, being effusive, you can say, well, look, that's what I do. I'm happy to introduce you to Wes and he might be able to help you with it if you wish. Mm -hmm. Or there's a million and one things we can do there to pivot, but can you see what we've nurtured? Yeah. You isolate the thing, you ask a what based question, whatever their response, you ask a why based question. If they ghost you, no worries, billion users. <laughs> if they don't get back to you in a while, no problem. What about the next guy? If they give you a pithy answer, that's fine because you've only just started a conversation. You can't expect these people to give you huge narratives on the depth of their problems. 
But if they are the personality typing that does, you just won the lottery. That person's just clearly an amazing lead. You know, when they give you paragraphs of like, had all of these problems, this is all going wrong. Can't miss. Let's get on a call then and I'll help you. So so and, it's just so powerful to probe a bit on the thing that they compliment you around. And, and I love that. And but you, you know where a lot of people get it wrong is behaving on LinkedIn like they wouldn't behave on real life. Yeah. You wouldn't yeah. fucking go to a person you just met and sell him something. Hey, I'm Martin. Please buy from me. Yes. Or it, what? I think what's even worse that people can tell is where it's like, nice to meet you. I know this thing over here. What do you know? What helped. do you know exactly? Exactly. And, and, and it's fascinating because what you described is actually really good conversation manner that most people apply on real life situation face to face. It's organic and human. But crucially, this is the thing that sh everyone should feel liberated by. These questions are incredibly reasonable. It's reasonable to say, yeah. So what part did you like of the live stream? It's and when they say the, yeah, and when they say the part, you're like, why? It's mm. a really reasonable question. It's not too probing, and that's what gets the conversation going. But look how focused that is on the thing you can help them with. Unless your content is so off piste, you're probing about a thing you can't help with. So it's yeah. it's a simple process. This is this is brilliant. But just just before you. Um, ask the next question, Martin. Oh, I just want to say we have actually got loads of people on live. I think there's something wrong with restream comments, but we've, you know, we're getting up to about 100 people on online at the moment. Cool. Maybe cool. if you can, if you've got any questions in the audience, because this is already a masterclass, um, you've got the next 10, 15 minutes with Richard Moore. Be selfish here, ask the questions that you want to know, yep. uh, and we'll see if we can get them answered. Um, go on, Martin. If for some reason you cannot have the questions in there, just DM one of us and and and, and, we'll, and we'll get it done. I have a provocation for you, Richard, and I think I think this is this is this is pure gold, literally. Like every single thing you're saying, like we can actually bring it to live into into LinkedIn and 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 start applying it, which is the whole which is the whole purpose of this, right? No bullshit things that people can bring to yeah. life. My provocation is around the concept of spending a good amount of time and successfully building an external brand and image on LinkedIn that does not reflect with exactly what you can produce. And by this, I mean fake experts, Yeah. right? So being perceived really good, but actually not being able to do the work. Yeah. So where is, where, where, help me understand about that, how we can go about understanding if someone is doing content for the sake of it, he he understood the content, he or she understood the content, and the perception is really good, but in reality, the actual work that this person can do is, is not really there. Yeah, I think this is a danger that um, may fall into the trap of, and being frank, just because of their age, those with a lesser experience are, are like to fall into the trap of this is tempting to focus so much on content and brand and so on perception and, and neglect and perception yeah and neglect products or service iteration it goes without saying i read a lot <laughs> from my image here but you know always being the student and having some humility and binning your ego and saying to yourself like what does me be even, being even better look like? And where can I go learn? And bothering to attend an event rather than try and always host the event is really mm. healthy. So like we must always iterate on the product. Otherwise we think we're good enough. And then we spend years selling this thing that's not up to scratch. So it's crucial we, we always do that. I, I think it's really important though to remember like if we are good, if we're genuinely experts, but our content makes us look like everyone else, it really is crucial to ask ourselves, what are the narratives that the average are putting out there? My peer group that are the average, what are, what are they putting out there? Mm -hmm. And where do I perhaps feel there needs to be an iteration on that or an evolution or a revision on that view? So I call that like reframe posting, which is when you say, you know how everyone says this, cool, but here's the extra. 
Yeah. And I think that that's really healthy. So if you are the expert, you feel that you're not getting through, your play for posts should be two parts. One is, here's a thing. Mm. But the second part is, and here's the twist. Because what you're yeah. doing is you're saying, here's the blind spot you weren't aware of, but I am because I can see higher because guess who the expert is? And it, it naturally makes an audience think to themselves, that person just clearly knows that much more. So when you see, and we talked about this a bit earlier, I think Martin raised it, like when you see entry level fluff and you feel like that's a peer group you need to break out of, you need to give the more measured, thoughtful nuggets of wisdom. Tell us the blind, about the blind spots. Tell us, give us the little things that, the tactical, hyper-practical things that actually someone wouldn't know unless they really know their stuff. But yeah, I mean, to your point, if we're not an expert yet, then sometimes you, no one wants to hear this, but sometimes you've got to suck it up and not be best in the game yet. Mm. And what that means is you have to, in the words of many successful people, you have to eat glass for a bit and for a bit, I mean years, while you operate at not at that level, you operate at this level. Sorry, you can't command five figure a month fees because you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You know, I couldn't command a six figure salary when I was 24 in the work I did. Yeah, I wasn't good enough. Suck it up. And the, the only way to get better was to iterate the product, which wasn't just the product I was selling. It was me as well. And sometimes you just need more experience. And we're all better today than we were yesterday. You know, I, I love that, and that makes me think about one of the other conversation that uh, that we had uh, um, not not long ago as well. Always being on beta, mm -hmm. you know, always, uh, always, always, always improving and always and always learning. And one of the motto that that we have uh, with WAM or at Factory or Confidential or Digital Focus, like one of the things that we keep saying, we always take notes during the workshop of things that we should do better and then we bring them to life. And the motto for me personally, that my best project is always the next one. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I always I always try to see it that way. And, and I love I love everything you said. And you know why I resonate with that so much richard because you're not a brand person but you speak brand terms yeah you spoke yeah. about positioning before you spoke about authenticity before you spoke about being real you, you, right now you spoke about you spoke about just 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 being honest and 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 how people are able to understand if you're there or if you're not if you're not that uh, and everything you said can be immediately translated into what a good brand is yeah i think i think ultimately it's about the more the people to, like it's very very rare someone effectively defines authenticity but when yeah. I think, when you genuinely are true to the level you're at and you know polish it sure be the best version of that but when you're really true to the level you're at and brutally honest with yourself and then broadcast that in the right way people really like they dig that because you're being real with them people can sense Pretens pretentious yeah. uh, a long way off and it's far 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 more easy to detect than our anyone's ability to to carry it off so I, I said this actually was a piece of content i wrote today which i, I basically said you've got to remember that the focus should be on better first and more second hmm. which means don't scale incompetency instead be really, really good and keep making that better and then scale that. And that goes for content. If you're crap, then more impressions is not going to help you being crap. You're just broadcasting you being crap even more elsewhere. So I just think it's 100%. so important to always focus on being better first. 100%. Uh, do, you, do you have, a, have you got a question there, Rez? Sorry, yeah. go on. All right. So like, I'm going to play devil's advocate. So you're talking to three people or four people in this conversation that all understand about our audience and how to talk to them. And there's people like Ada in the chat about talking about you're not speaking the language uh, of the people you want to attract. But let's just dumb it down for the people that are listening. Have you got any advice, hacks, insights on, on defining that person or that audience that you're trying to talk to? Because that's a question we get asked a lot. Like, How do we find this? How do we figure this out? 
is our audience the same as as the people that want to listen or is our audience the, the people that, that are going to buy or potentially buy or is that irrelevant like give yeah, us yeah I, I think it's i remember i went to a workshop many years ago and it was like we're going to work out for you in this in this workshop your icp we're going to do it today and sort it all out and there's lots of cute questions and worksheets and things like that and it's like we're going to emerge knowing your icp i'm like this is rubbish because the true answer is this, and this is just dumbing it down. True answer is this, the people you should target and the things you should say to them, spend some time considering, and this is crucial, probably what is about right. Okay. That's your start point. Now do it lots and you can't guess it from the sidelines. You only guess through proof of, con you work out from proof of, proof of concept. Mm -hmm. So I call it honing your philosophy. So knowing what to say and how to answer questions for instance i got really good at because i did a live stream every monday called startup business q a for five years that's 268 <laughs> consecutive weeks and i answered about six thousand questions i think i worked out so i got really good at a thing and hearing myself over and over again answering questions mm -hmm. and i got really good at tuning into what people were saying so it's contact time you know and i think there's too much can I follow steps A, B, C and theorize what the solution is? Usually about what's probably right is your start point. And now do it a load. And you'll, it sounds like it's like wafty, but you tend to find that's how you get good feedback. So you three, by doing your no doubt high caliber workshops, they're probably iterating as you go. And if you did another 50, I bet yeah. they'd be even more magnificent purely through just naturally evolving uh, rather than we know 50 workshops from now, we will do it this way because we can write down on a piece of paper. How yeah. Perfect. You have to feel your way and feel is based on what, what you're getting back from the audience, but also what you're getting back from the bank account as well. A hundred percent. There is, there is, there is no faking it. Like you have to do the work and the best possible way. Going back to the very early of this conversation, that you need to speak like them, ask them with their vocabulary. The only way to get that vocabulary is actually to go and speak with them. Yeah, one one of the coaches I had many years ago said you need five to eight um, clients to start having the basic proof of concept as to what they need. And he said, what you want to look out for is when you've closed those sales, what kind of language and vernacular was used? What worked, yeah. Yeah, what, what worked in the deals, sure, and, and what worked in delivering, sure. But crucially, what kind of things were they saying and how were they saying them on the sales call? And what's interesting is when you keep hearing people saying the same kind of things, what feels like many reasons why they're struggling turns into six with three main ones and that's it and this is variations of the same theme mm. and so what's interesting is your content then gets better and better because the best content is the content as i said earlier that shows awareness for the symptoms of the problem that your clients have your prospects have not awareness of their problems and this is a new i want to bring this up this is a nuance that's massively overlooked Everyone's like, oh, you should talk about your customer's problems. Mm -hmm. If I go to a doctor with a cough and a wheezy chest, I don't know that I've got bronchitis. Bronchitis is the problem, the wheezy chest and the cough. That's the symptoms. Your customers, and, and I, let's use you lot as an example, typically the average managing director of a 19 million pound business isn't sitting there going, do you know what's wrong? It's the brand. It's definitely the brand mm. strategy. I need to fix. And this guy's running, you know, a shoe company. He's not going, I need to, it's the brand of the website. The UX is off. He's not thinking that, but she or he are experiencing the symptoms of having a shit brand and that needs fixing. Yeah. So when you use the language as in inverted commas, the actual wording that they use, to describe the symptoms they're experiencing suddenly and then is suddenly the audience is like that's you're in my head that's so what i'm going this through. is it yeah but, but what's crucial in new and nuance within this we want to talk about getting this right is 
you three are experts at understanding brands and brand strategy. Therefore, the way you would describe the symptoms your customers go through are probably is probably so beautiful and elegant, but that's not how they would describe it. So their inner dialogue, yeah, everyone listening, the inner dialogue is the wording that your prospects would use to yeah. describe their their symptoms, not the wording you would use. Yeah, I and mean, this is this is like so powerful. I think we we, we everyone needs to play this again. Yeah. But it's not about how you will describe it, but it's how how they will describe it, so they can understand that you're speaking that language. I think I think this is this is this is I think this is it. Yeah. I think to me, this feels like the number one thing that you should print and have on top of your of your of your laptop. And when you're writing every every piece of content, you should you should answer like, is this is yeah. this uh, answering to this because. A lot of the people in brand and branding have this mistake. No one bloody knows what yeah. the heck is brand and branding. No one no. knows. Not even people working in the industry. They're not considering it in the slightest. No, With no, all that no. respect, it's not. That's no. brand strategy and brand. Like that's your tool to yeah, fix correct. Problem, yeah, correct. But it's not. They don't care. They just need. They to don't. They don't them. care. No. They don't care. And, and we are stuck into brand versus marketing, branding, brand strategy. We only ask them about a conversation. No one else gives an F about that conversation. This, this is that will not make money. This is dangerous because this is the trap that people fall into. If you look at enough content, people write content for their peer group. Yeah. yeah. And what happens is everyone gives them a pat on the back going, yeah, great point about brand, mm -hmm. man. Love your points on brand says the brand strategist in there yeah, yeah 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 meanwhile i'm guilty of that to be honest yeah me, no, meanwhile the ceo is just like well that's obviously not not for me then i don't I'll get go it. look over here at something else so we just got to tune in right you're absolutely right it's really interesting yeah. I, I i do mentoring and uh, one of my first challenges i get asked this a lot like how do i sell brand and that's normally a, a segment that we have to oh. we have to cover and I, I just try and get them to actually sell brand to me without using that exact word I'm yes like, don't use that word like to try that try and do this with me now and they're probably listening but like it's a hard thing to do and and the advice i always give is like sell me brand without mentioning that term brand because yeah as you say like that audience don't understand it and when they do understand it they think it's a palette a, a logo you know some marketing material they don't understand that it is the it's the, the, the you know the perception we leave behind they don't get that bit they, mm. it's a it's a set of end outcomes that yeah. solve a set of earlier symptoms yeah. and the device happens to be in this case a brand strategy that improves they get yeah. that's yeah. the that's the vehicle that's all uh, it, yeah a lot of people sell the tools and it's like the a mechanic process. Yeah. Yeah, yeah totally yeah totally love it amazing richard this, this was this was just gold and we i know you can go on for ages but um yes yeah, yeah, so it easily be a four-hour chat couldn't it, i think so so, eas so easily can i do um, one last thing i know we've got four minutes but i want to do it yeah rich can you ask yeah. us questions or ask us a yeah. question? come on absolutely Wes loves this one no i i love stuff like this so what's something oh they start let me i'm going to pick you at random so i start no no not, not that question rich another one <laughs> <laughs> It's before the watershed. So I'm going to ask Martin, I'm going to ask Martin first. What's something that you um, wish, that you hope that people would say about Wham? What's something you hope people would say about Wham? Because that's something you can map towards. Yeah, I, I, I think I think it it it, it changed it changed my 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 life for the better in something, right? I think I think the things that were really good is is like like problem solving and critical and understanding what is that one thing that you would like to take off our engagement and we want to double down and sort and sort that out hmm. it's interesting. it changed my life and it became easier in xyz yeah. it's great when we ask ourselves this, this question isn't it because we end up we end up with an answer it's like that's what we should be mapping towards yeah. not just oh thanks for the work today guys it's like that kind of impact that's a really good answer. Um, first, my question for Wes uh, is people think a certain thing about brand strategy. What's the bit that they're missing in your opinion? Like that, that, you know, that winds you up. What's probably I, the thing? You know, the reason why I left corporate, the reason why I still peeve and get pissed off 
sorry for the disclaimer, but nobody activates, man. Like even even trained strategists, even strategists that have got ribbons and certificates, they think they've got this. They walk out of a room and they land this brand strategy. Nine times out of ten, it's beautifully written poetry. It sits on a desk. It's never ever ever encouraged to activate. It's never right. It's like I've got a famous saying, and it's it's dark and it's deep, but it's true. You should not aim to build uh, to to birth stillborns. The brand you should give every 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 effort or attempt you can to make it live. And if that means activating it, holding its hand, holding the CEO's hand, walking with them, walking through that fire, brands die if they don't do that. The thing that's missing is activation. The thing that's missing is a damn heartbeat. And if you don't mm. supply that heartbeat, it's game over and it will die. And then strategists then get the blame. And they, yeah, do, they, get the blame. they should get the blame because if they're not h helping and being accountable and sharing the same goal as the CEO or the person that's employed you, then yeah, they should get the blame. But if they're not, and we're holding hands together and it mm. dies, then it's then it's legit. Right? But the bit that's missing yeah. is the lifeline to any brand and that and that is the aid and support it needs after the strategy. Love. I say it's a lot about training actually. It's like it's easy to train and then stroll off and everyone feels warm and fuzzy. But good yeah. training includes follow up. Ooh. And like follow through and accountability. You're totally right. And I love that. Like that mutual accountability really, really matters. <laughs> Uh, you're getting some cheerleading in the comments from that way. I was going to say, can I just answer the, the question that you asked Martin? And this is the answer. Yeah, it doesn't get you out of another question, Ash, but yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to print this one and have it in my office. I'm going to have like beautiful print and just going to make me, make me give, give my, like make my day every day. Uh, I have a question for Ash as well, or he's too boring. Come on, give him it. I love it. So, so why do you feel one of the prevailing attitudes is that branding is fluff mm. in business Ooh. come on mash we've got a slide on this yeah to get strong and like, get bold it's with three slides that. actually <laughs> um so wh why why is there this perception that branding is fluff by many that is a prevailing perception like oh it's just fluffy stuff and we can live without it um i i i generally think um it's because the um there's a lot of people pushing the same old stuff and and they they probably feel that same old stuff like design and um the visual stuff is what branding is and it can't be can't be measured right um and and i think that's why it's usually we we're talking about this earlier on it's usually like the cfos um mm -hmm. that are measuring on return on investment and when something can't be easily measured in the short term, then it's considered fluff or not as uh, uh, as much as of a priority. Yeah. Uh, and and I think I think we as an industry and brand strategists have to do a better job at communicating that. Yeah. Uh, uh, sadly, and and I think it is true that we we still have to do a lot on that on that awareness piece, and that's why you probably see a lot of post and carousels about what branding is mm -hmm. and even still when you put out that content people still not are not getting it right yeah. so um yeah I, I think it's i think i'm not just blaming the client side i think it's our problem as well that we have to educate more but i think it's well, generally is that if i may if i may sometimes it's just a, it requires another generation you know if you look at things like being more sustainable it just was a bit weird in the past and like whatever. And then some very few progressive people started doing it and they were a bit weird. And now it's like de rigueur, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I think it, it, it just needs to evolve into being, and if, you, if I look back say 20 years, just briefly before we finish, a really good example was a disconnect between sales and marketing. And, the, and I, I remember working with a company where like the shit was hitting the fan and they binned off the marketing function to mm. free up money or to cut to not have to spend as much money. And they just nailed down on sales. Like, well, you can make some money now, but it's going to be harder to do it. And oh it's like, what, what limbs can we cut off to still survive? And I think that it's, it's dangerous to do that. So yeah, it's right to keep beating the drum. Very dangerous. And to wrap that up, because we live in a time of crisis, we live in a time of uncertainty, especially, especially UK, almost every other day, there is, there is a bomb happening and like everyone is getting depressed and like, it's, it's just, it's just mad, but it's everywhere in the world. And, 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 and these things are very much real, you know, cutting down on marketing. 
but that's exactly the opposite that you need to do in a time of crisis, of market saturations, of Mia-like products, of product feature being all look-alike and crisis. What you need to double down is actually marketing and branding to stand yeah. out. Yeah, be bold. And and I remember in 2008, the business I was in, thank goodness, was led by a com- with a, by a guy who's like, this is where we grow. Everyone's yes. tightening their belts and they're cutting all their, co- their their costs and that. This is where we grow. This is our land grab moment. And we're like, are you sure, Amen. man? It's getting scary. And he's like, no, this is where boldness is. It takes us forward. So I, I totally agree with yeah, that. hundred percent. Richard, thank you very much for being generous with your time. And this was truly a masterclass. I'm going to rewatch it as well in a few days. Uh, so, just so nice to hang out with you three. Thank just, you so much for having me. Just before you go, I want to cool. I want to also um, just, you know, is there anything else out there that you're working on doing? What what should be people be checking out apart from the LinkedIn Accelerator? Well, I'm glad you asked, Ash. Um, so, there's a, um, so I've been behind the scenes. I've been building um, some courses for LinkedIn. Uh, so they very kindly reached out and said, this is an exclusive. I've not released this information anywhere. Mm. You heard it here first at the water cooler. So LinkedIn asked me to build them three courses. I'm not able to say what they're on yet. I'm not allowed, um, but they'll be coming out probably the first one in the next month or so, um, subject to being tweaked and so on. I'm really excited about it. And um, yeah, looking forward to it. So thank you very much for asking. Likewise. Amazing. Yeah, and go and check uh, Richard's profile as well and his profile section. There's loads of stuff there that can help you as well. Thanks again, Richard. Really appreciate it. I enjoy myself. Thank you. I hopefully uh, come back again sometime in the future. Yeah, man. We'll get back for uh, We can talk more about the lockdown boomers in brand and how that their world intended. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if get a bit more gossipy. That'd be good fun. I must start. Thank you so much, everyone else. Yeah. See you later. <laughs>